Okay, so I think we can get going. So uh, welcome everybody. So uh, my name's uh, Richard Merrill, and it's my great pleasure to welcome everybody to um, another um, seminar in our series for the integration of speciation research. Um, so just to remind everybody who we are, we are um, an ESAB funded um, special top works, topics network for the integration of speciation research. And we have um, two major aims. The first is to, to kind of promote a framework to uh, for integration of uh, speciation research across systems. And to do this, we're um, planning to hold a number of workshops and also uh, generating a, a database of, um, of data uh, relating to speciation research. And then secondly, we're also hoping to integrate uh, speciation research and in particular, and also speciation researchers um, across, across the world, but also across systems um, to increase uh, diversity and inclusion and also to, of course, improve our own research and work. Um, so part of this uh, um, is this seminar series, uh, which has been going on for um, a, um, a few months now. Um, so just to explain how this, this will work, we have um, one, hour, um, um, one hour of talks from two speakers, each of which will be about 20, 25 minutes long, um, followed by um, questions. We ask that if you can type your questions in the chat box, um, we can read them out. Uh, just so you know, this um, seminar uh, is recorded and will be available um, through our website um, and also on, on YouTube. Um, and then after the talks, we'll have uh, 30 minutes of, of general discussion uh, relating to our topic today. Uh, please uh, follow us on Twitter for more kind of information. Also sign up on the, uh, the web page here um, to get to join the mailing list and find out more about what we're doing. So today we, we're starting a new uh, theme which relates to the challenges of uh, measuring reproductive isolation. And we have two speakers, Anna Karnstrom and James Sobel. So it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Anna. Um, so Professor Anna Karnstrom from, the, uh, from Uppsala University in Sweden, who I think uh, many of us uh, will already well know very well and especially her work. So. Anna studied as an undergraduate and a PhD student um, at Uppsala University. Um, and then after a very short postdoc in San Diego, then returned to Uppsala, I believe, to start her own group in uh, 2002. Um, and then she also moved on um, to becoming a professor of animal ecology in that department. And I now believe is Dean of Research for Science and Technology. Uh, so Anna has uh, won uh, numerous awards including the American Society of Naturalists uh, Young Investigator Award and the U European Young Investigator Award. Um, she's also um, hosted a number of PhD students and postdocs who have already got on to start some really great labs themselves. So that's a really great um, legacy. But most importantly, she's done some really uh, fantastic work over the years on kind of evolution and ecology and genetics, um, specifically focusing on uh, flycatchers, but also in uh, poison arrow frogs, um, and this is um, spread across a whole number of uh, different questions, many of which um, relate to behavior and ecology, um, but also importantly for us today, um, speciation. And I believe today she's going to talk about uh, genetic incompatibilities in the fly catchers. So I will leave it to you, Anna, and thank you for joining us, and um, I'll stop okay. sharing my screen. Thank you. I will start sharing mine. Okay, so I will be talking about genetic incompatibilities in cellular flycatchers. And when we study uh, speciation in sexually reproducing animals, we're interested in the evolutionary changes that lead to reproductive isolation. So starting off with one population that will evolve in different directions, like splitting into two populations, and what is happening during that process. And reproductive isolation can come in very many different forms. So I give a few examples here. And typically we divide them into two different categories, reproductive isolation sources that acts before the hybrid cycle is formed 
and reproductive isolation sources that acts after the formation of a hybrid. And we typically see speciation as a gradual process and there occur genetic changes in the two diverging populations over time. And when this happens, there will be a combination of pre and post isolation phenotypes evolving. And they are ensuring that these two populations can evolve in different directions, even if they are a secondary contact. Uh, hybrid dysfunction in terms of severe genetic incompatibilities that is causing hybrids to, to become sterile or even inviable is thought to happen very late. So when speciation is more or less complete. And this would be the most popular or well-known model for how this can be achieved. So when the two populations are experiencing allopatry, different mutations can occur. And when the two populations come in secondary contact, these alleles that have mutated into different forms in allopatry might not work properly together because they uh, lack an evolutionary history. And there could be problems arising in the hybrids. And these problems are, um, because these genetic incompatibilities are expected to sort of, once they start uh, evolving, they would take off and increase in a snowballing fashion. And typically we know that hybrid sterility occurs uh, faster than hybrid inviability. And, but otherwise quite little is known about this snowballing. It's very difficult to, to study. But, and even classical BDMIs are sensitive to, to purging and hence could collapse at secondary contact. So we can't be that safe once we have genetic incompatibilities that the speciation process is actually completed. We should rather think of the speciation continuum as a process that can go in both directions. And according to theory, BDMIs are predicted to be more resistance to purging when the evolved alleles are subject to positive selection in either parental population. And this means that if we really would like to figure out what the role of genetic incompatibilities are in the speciation process, we need to extend empirical studies of BDMIs beyond laboratory systems, but it's very challenging to study them in the wild. But uh, pied and collared flycatchers are a quite good study system for doing this. You can see uh, collared flycatchers here at the corner. They have a, a more sudden uh, distribution range when they breed as compared to pied flycatchers that has a more northern distribution range in Europe. And these two species diverged less than Half a million, less than a million year ago, probably just half a million year ago. And they are both migratory, but they come to Europe when they breed and they co-occur here in Central Europe and on the Swedish islands in the Baltic, Ireland and Gotland, where we study them. So the red dots here represent nest box areas. So it's easy to collect information on these birds. Both species, prefer to breed in deciduous forest. But collared flycatchers are a little bit more aggressive. So they tend to displace pied flycatchers from uh, the more preferred areas. And this is one of the important ecological differences between the two species actually. So they don't differ in morphological traits. They are both generalistic uh, insects eaters but they do differ in several life history traits. So the collar flycatchers are more aggressive. Their young beg more, they have smaller clutches, and they are more sensitive to harsh conditions. And these differences probably reflect different adaptations to different climates. And to simplify, we can view collar flycatchers as a portion, 
empowered flycatchers as a more stirred evolver. And when I ask people what car they would prefer if they want to win a race, the right answer would be that this depend on the conditions experienced. But today I will talk about the dynamic basis of hybrid incompatibility or hybrid sterility in these flycatchers. And this is work that has been done with my PhD student, Carolina Segami, who defended her thesis this now in May. And this is the list of co-authors on the work that I will be presenting now. So these hybrids are actually totally sterile. So measuring reproductive isolation is not that tricky in the flycatchers, it's actually complete. But pinpointing these incompatibilities is a challenge. So we knew from before that the males have a sort of aberrant uh, phenotype when it's come to the sperm and that they fail to sire offspring in their nests. But to actually pinpoint what is exactly going wrong and what are the incompatibility genes underlying these problems is quite difficult. And spermatogenesis is a very, where when sperm is produced, it's a very complex process. So there's a lot of things that could potentially go wrong. And if we look at testing size and, and sperm morphology across species, even quite close related species, it's actually astonishingly diverged. And it's guided by, by fast evolving genes. This process is also very complex and it actually, uh, the test is actually contain more specific um, cell times, cell types as compared to the brain. And it has only been described at the single cell level in mammals where males are heterogametic. So we had a bit of a problem when we started doing this because we had to start from scratch. But uh, I will not give you the full story. I will sort of jump directly into uh, what did work. So what is going wrong during sperm production in hybrid flycatchers? We used three main methods to figure that out. Most importantly, we used single cell transitomics of the whole testes. And then we could divide the testes cells into different clusters belonging to the same developmental stage and order the stage across a timeline. And then we could look at each cluster against like the pure species and the hybrids and also against the two different species to look at what genes are differentially expressed between the two species and where do we see mis-expression in the hybrids. In that way, we could pinpoint the developmental stage where things are going wrong in the hybrids. We also combine these methods with genome sequence data to investigate patterns of sequence divergence and more specifically fixed differences in the relevant gene sets that would underlie the network of genes that would sort of guide these different stages in this process of spermatogenesis. And finally, we also used histology sections to be able to visually um, investigate the organization and structure within the testes and to see the form of the spermatids. So what, what were the predictions? So for simplicity, spermatogenesis can be divided into three major steps. The first step would be very basic here, mitosis occurs. And then we have the second step where the different cells go through meiosis, various stages. And in the final stage, the sperm acquire the sperm typic traits like tails and other specific traits. And we would expect to have very strong purifying natural selection acting on the first two stages because these are very basic. So if something goes wrong here, it's actually 
very devastating and it's more like housekeeping genes are expected to be relevant here. So there should be very strong purifying selection and little divergence between species. But the final stages are very, well, the very final stage is subject to strong sexual selection. And this is the stage where the sperm, sperm get all these traits that vary a lot between species. So we expected also to see an enrichment of settling genes because sex specific traits are expected to be encoded by the sex chromosomes, which is the Z chromosomes in birds. And we also thought it would be most likely to find incompatibilities acting on the later stages because these are fast evolving genes and there should be more differences between these two species found here at this last stage. So these are the different cell clusters I was talking about. We found 17 different uh, cell clusters in the flycatchers. So these are going through the different stages. These um, different clusters are going through the first stages of mitosis. These clusters are going through the second stage that will have various stages of meiosis. And finally, this would be the last stage where they acquire all these specific traits. So uh, what would be the main results? We found that most differentially expressed genes between the two species were actually found at the last stage of spermatogenesis as we expected. But the strongest evidence for missed expression in hybrids was actually detected already during meiosis. So something is going very, very wrong in the hybrids. Also, when we use sequence data and investigated patterns of gene ontology, we found that most uh, or very many non-synonymous fixed differences were actually found in networks involved in key processes of meiosis. So these are very important differences between the two species and it's causing very big problems in the poor hybrid males. Histology sections also uh, detected the same sort of problems. You can see here that in the hybrids, fewer sperm are produced. They have those abnormal big heads and there's also less quantity of spermatids which we would expect if they have problems in the sort of basic stages when you have multiplication like in meiosis <clears throat> and mitosis. So the combined evidence from the flycatchers so shows that failure during meiosis leads to aberrant chromosome segregation and faulty chromatin packing and spermatogenesis of hybrid males. So what can we conclude? So in male hybrid flycatchers, spermatogenesis actually goes through all the main developmental st stages. So we find 17 different cell clusters also in hybrid males. But some serious failures occur already at meiosis. And there is also an overrepresentation of settling genes among the candidate incompatibility genes. So what we see here is actually divergence in genes with highly conserved and sanctioned uh, functions that ensure reproductive isolation between the two flycatchers. So even if it's slowly evolving genes, a few changes in those genes cause a high degree of reproductive isolation. So that would be the main conclusion. And I also would like to thank the whole research group and all fantastic field teams and collaborators and sources of funding and research infrastructures. Thank you. That's, that's great. Thank you, Anna. Um, it was a really, really nice talk. Um, do we have any questions for Anna? And if you do, can you type them into the chat um, and I can read them out.
whilst people are typing, unless I'm missing, it's up there. Okay, so I. So I, I've got one from uh, Scott Egan. Uh, so I, was... I might need to stop sharing to be able to see them. Okay, I, I can also read them, but. Um... Okay, yeah, go ahead. So, <laughs> so the first one's from Scott Egan. Uh, so was there anything specific about males being the heterochromatic sex? So uh, you would expect um, hybrid incompatibilities in terms of hybrids really to evolve faster in the heterogametic sex. But uh, in birds, males are act actually the homogametic sex. Okay. And then uh, Jim uh, Mallet follows up with that. So do we know anything about female sterility? Female sterility in the flycatchers? In the flycatchers, yeah. Yeah, they also sterile. Okay, but we don't know anything about the genetic basis. So um, I think because the problems are so early on in meiosis, I think it's highly probable that the females are experience the same problem. Okay. And then Roger Butler asks, are there many genes underlying uh, BDMIs? In the flycatchers, you mean, or in this case? I guess Roger can. Yeah, I, I mean these ones specifically underlying the the BDMIs you see in meiosis. Yeah, mm. yeah it's quite a few. Mm. Not super many. Um. Um, so Astrid uh, Groot, I'm trying to find. Um, um, says, I'm not familiar with single cell analyses and wonder how do you identify the 17 clusters to be part of three stages, mitosis, meiosis, and spermatids? Oh, yeah, it is very different, uh, different methods, but um, one would be that you first classify them depending on gene expression patterns, and then there are some genes that are sort of have a known function and then you can know if they are what what sort of stage they belong to. So typically, if they are involved in formation of flagella, we would know that that would be the last stage of spermatogenesis. Then uh, Carol, I assume Carol Schmader, asks, how much physical linkage is there between these new, numerous hybrid incompatibility genes and genes underlying behavioral isolation? Oh, uh, we, haven't, we haven't checked that yet, but that's that's a good question. Um, and then, uh, Yona, you indicated reproductive isolation is complete and males are completely sterile. Is there any possibility of gene flow, any hybrids su surviving and reproducing at all? So um, we, we thought that in the past, um, that it was possible. And we have also detected some gene flow between the flycatchers, like when we look at um, look it from a sequence perspective, but it's very difficult to date it. And um, I've been hoping to find a fertile hybrid because that would be very interesting, but I failed so far. So it's... Um, uh, mm. I think they have much bigger problems than we originally thought. So uh, Darin Almogil um, says, very interesting talk, I agree. Uh, do you know anything about the effect of the direction on hybrid cross on sterility? So I guess, are they, are they ster sterile in both directions across? Yeah, because there are so um, basic genes involved. I would expect so, but we have actually just looked at one direction of the cross for the males. It was uh, only two hybrid males involved and they both had a pied flycatcher female as a mother. Um, so Martin Golovsky asks whether you know anything about, um, so do you know what kind of misexpression uh, you have in there? Okay, what, what kind? Um, so it's deviating, so it's either much uh, higher or much lower, so it's not in between of the two parental species, so it's really um, way up. Um, 
and then Scott Egan again asked, well, what about the distribution of uh, differentially expressed genes between autosomes versus sex chromosomes? I'm sorry, yeah, so there is, a, um, we find both, uh, and there is a slight enrichment of Z chromosome linked ones. I think, have I missed any questions? I think. Thank you very much. I think we can we can move on, and I think we'll have more questions during the uh, the uh, may, uh, the big discussion at the end. So thanks very much. I'll let Roger take over. Okay. Thank you very much, Anna. So it's now my pleasure to introduce Jay Sobel. Um, Jay is currently at Binghamton University, New York State, um, and he's he's well known for uh, extensive work on reproductive isolation in plants, especially. Uh, monkey flowers, genus uh, Mimulus. Um, I actually looked at his uh, research web pages yesterday and I see there that his group aims to answer questions like uh, which forms of reproductive isolation are the most important for the speciation process and what is the genetic and molecular basis of uh, the traits involved? What role does adaptation uh, to different habitats play in generating new species? Those are all questions that all of us here are really interested to have the answers to. So I'm very much looking forward to, to his talk. And I think many of you will also know Jay from two very influential uh, reviews, the, the Sovel et al. 2010 review about non-ecological, ecological and non-ecological speciation, and the 2014 paper with Chen about um, uh, measuring reproductive isolation. Um, so he's, he's been an important contributor to the sorts of questions we're ask, asking in, in this session, and we very much look forward to hearing his talk today, which is about opportunities and challenges in uh, estimating reproductive isolation across the monkey flowers. Uh, so over to you, Jay. Great, thank you. All right, let me uh, share this. Let's see how this works. Do I look okay? Oh, no, that looks, uh, no, you're not going to start. There. Yep. <laughs> there we go. Let me, there we let go. Me, there we go. Good. Okay. Uh, so it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I really appreciate being invited to, uh, to give a talk today about, about the subject um, near and dear to my heart. Um, I do feel a little bit like I, I preparing for this talk, I, I of course, um, went out and, and started reading some of the most recent things on reproductive isolation to, to try to, to remind myself some of the issues that have, that have come up in the past. Of course, there's this, this fantastic set of papers that just arrived, and I feel a little bit like somebody who's arrived late to a party and, and just sort of like grinning like an idiot and nodding at everything, because I've read through a lot of these, and I find a lot of really interesting and useful um, commentaries here, just trying to define what reproductive isolation is because um, obviously we have to know what it is before we can we can measure it. Um, and so I'm I'm you know still processing a lot of those and I would I would love to continue that conversation. I'm looking forward to future sessions um, led by some of those authors. Um, my outline here for the talk is just I want to talk about some of the challenges I see in measuring reproductive isolation, um, how some of the recent definitions are are a little bit different. Um, I'm gonna Deal with the age-old problem of allopatry that that uh, many of us have have tread across when trying to decide what to do with isolation, and then um, and talk a little bit about uh, some of the past work we've done in trying to to develop metrics for how we measure the strength of RI. Um, from there, I want to I want to focus on opportunities and where I think we can improve our understanding of of reproductive isolation the most. Um, I, I will use my my favorite organism, Mimulus, the, the monkey flowers. And, and try to, to make a pitch for um, considering all of the biology of speciation in multiple forms of isolation in, in the same system. So we can try to, to, to both integrate across forms of reproductive isolation and across, across uh, um, taxa that, that uh, maybe have been overlooked. Um, so to start, I wanna actually jump into one of the differences I see in definitions in some of these recent reviews that have just come out and what has been asking was reproductive isolation. Um, two, two competing hypotheses here about, or, or competing ideas, uh, reproductive isolation in the Western paper recently um, really focuses on this, this effect of genetic differences between populations and, and the effect they have on gene flow. 
um, where, whereas one of the replies that, that Roger put together um, defines isolation as, as a reduction in the production of viable and fertile offspring without referring to differences between, between um, taxa. And so I, I, I'd like to explore that a little bit because I think it's an important important difference. And, and I start with whatever reproductive isolation is, we have to agree that, that it's caused by barriers, I hope. Um, and, and we have a couple of intuitive uh, sort of figures here from, from um, Sean Stankowski's and Mark Ravenet's uh, uh, excellent review on the continuum of speciation, um, where we think about this sort of funnel analogy of reproductive isolation and the way that genes might flow through from population to population, um, where, where gene flow can only be impeded by one barrier if it gets past the previous one. Um, and, and again, a, a, a very intuitive, I'm kind of skipping going from D to A, but the, a very intuitive sort of way to think about this is taking your effective migration rate, how, how many migrants actually contribute to, um, to population one from population two, and divided by the total amount of migration that occurred would give you an idea of how much isolation there is. Um, and I want to make sure to, to sort of to, to go back to an age-old question about allopatry, what do you do when the denominator is zero? What do we do when migration is, is zero or close to zero, or where migration rates are so low that they're effectively zero? Um, and so, you know, this is this is uh, an old from from that 2010 paper um, from a long time ago, but just asking this question: Should we include geography as a component of, of reproductive isolation? This is an old argument, but there are good arguments on on both sides of it. Um, one being, yeah, we should because I've drawn this figure where there's X's and O's on two sides of a mountain range, and that seems really simple and, and elementary, but it's actually there's there's biology there too, um, implying that X can't reach O's habitat and O can't reach X's habitat because of biological properties of those organisms. They, you know, if they live in low elevations and they can't cross that mountain range. Then that that uh, that physical barrier becomes something that prevents gene flow. Um, so we think about of uh, some of the, the excellent uh, examples of niche conservatism actually promoting allopatry. You can make the case that yes, we should include um, uh, geography in, in as a as a component of isolation. Um, and then many others would say that that allopatry only removes a constraint to divergence that 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 migration um, produces, and and that might allow other barriers to arise. And, and my, my personal view is sort of in between, is that we have, have two different, not two, but it's a continuum, but, but sort of let's start with two different outcomes, is that, that when you have different geographic distributions and, and they occur due to biological differences between taxa, and I want to connect that to the definition of reproductive isolation that Western et al. use, I've referred to that, we've referred to this as ecogeographic isolation, that, that there's a biological reason, there's differences between the taxa that prevent them from, from moving into each other's habitat. You can imagine a, a reciprocal transplant experiment if you moved one to the other would, would you'd see zero fitness um, of one species in the other's habitat. Um, nevertheless, you know, even when there's not uh, uh, ecogeographic isolation, a physical barrier could still produce uh, a, a barrier to gene flow. And, and this is, is where we, we've used this in, in um, my 2010 paper that that would be considered effective geographic isolation. And one of the issues that, that I see in, in connecting values of isolation that we calculate in experiments to population genetic parameters is that this case in which there are no differences between populations on either side of that divide would still begin to produce population signatures and divergence that that would not be due to differences between those taxa. And so on the one hand, I think that those differences are really important, but but on the other hand, that sort of organismal versus versus a genetic view, I think is going to be in sort of in conflict with each other in these cases. Um, and, and allopatry um, could certainly could certainly cause cause issues as, as it has for a very long time. Of course, th this has been known for, for decades. Um, so I, I just wanted to, to go through a quick history of, of how we estimate the strength of reproductive isolation. Um, Quinn and Orr and, and in 1989 and then, and then the follow-up in 97, this paper where, where uh, um, they estimate the strength of isolation across multiple Drosophila taxa. And then uh, Justin Ramsey's paper, uh, Doug Shemsky's lab, um, were the two most influential to my mind that, that really started this, this uh, 
um, a, a real trend in, in measuring isolation multiple taxa. And to borrow a, a phrase from my family, you, you know, there was a period of time where everybody was doing, you couldn't swing a dead cat without hitting a grad student that was doing isolation studies back when I was a grad student. So um, very, very popular to try to take these approaches and, and, and uh, estimate how much gene flow is impeded by barriers. Um, at, as I was a, a early career grad student, um, uh, another grad student in Chemsky's lab, Grace Chen and I started to, to comb through all the various ways that people had, had begun estimating isolation. And we, we realized really quickly that everybody was doing it differently. And so Grace and I spent a very long time with, a, with an old antique chalkboard and a lot of chalk and just tried to come up with you know, so situations where we could, could imagine genes flowing between population one and population two. And we, and we arrived at this, this equation for um, estimating strength of barriers that, that had an intuitive sort of appeal because it was this linear formulation that when, when there's random mating at 50% um, conspecific and heterospecific mating, you would get no gene flow and you get complete at one, but then when you get all the way over to the negative side, it's also at negative one. And so you had this nice sort of linear, linear uh, formulation. Um, and we, we truly came up with this doing things like this, where we just like invent a situation in our head, start out with, with a, a population of, of hypothetical organisms and just ask, you know, let's impose this, this form of isolation, um, pre-zygotic versus post-zygotic, and we use this equation to calculate the, the, the strength of that barrier. And we see this, this uh, um, you know, with, with our, the equation that we propose, we see this sort of intuitive connection to, to gene flow because it's a, a proportional reduction in how much you see hybridization happening relative to random expectations. Um, for example, here in mating isolation, if, it, if we calculated a value of 0.6, that 0.6 means something you could say what it means. It's 60% reduction in, in hybridization compared to what you expected. Um, and the same is true on the post psychotic side. So if you impose a survival difference between conspecific and heterospecific offspring, you'd get this 60% reduction um, that represents how much um, you think gene flow changes from, from, um, from barrier to barrier. Um, and aside from that, being able to just articulate what it means, I think one of the nice uh, sort of uh, appeals of this metric was just that when you start seeing negative values, like, like in cases of heterosis, again, it, it's something you can relate to the positive values of isolation. So this is a reanalysis of some of that um, work from Justin Ramsey, where there's one of the post barriers where there's a negative value because the hybrids are much larger than either, either the parent offspring. Um, a, a case where hybridization, you know, one trait might facilitate gene flow between, between taxa. Um, our, our version of, of how you would, you would calculate isolation is a negative value just like it was previously, but now it's a negative value we can sort of apply to the other positive values. It's a 40% increase in, in how much gene flow you ex it expect um, as opposed to, to a decrease if it was a value of isolation. Um, so it, it had, had appeal in, in multiple ways. Um, and what you can do with this, and I think this, you know, sort of the, the exciting thing to, to do is a recent review from Dave Lowry's lab. It's sort of a follow-up. Um, to a paper he wrote about 15 years ago. And using these sort of standardized calculations, we can compare the strength of isolation across all sorts of different species and taxa. So this is, this is a, uh, you know, this most recent review that just came out. Um, and you see that there's some trends that are emerging here when, when you look at pre and post zygotic isolation in seed plants. Um, pre zygotic isolation is, is, tends to be stronger, quite a bit stronger. Um, and so, it, you know, this, this is the sort of thing that having one specific set of, of metrics can do is that all these barriers are comparable and then across multiple different species, it's comparable. Um, so um, from there, I wanted to sort of transition to talking about uh, how we would use metrics of isolation, but also where we might improve our understanding of speciation beyond sort of these comparative um, studies. And, and I'll just, you know, I, I, everybody's familiar with the monkey flowers. They're sort of amazing in the diversity of habitats you find them in. The, the top three are just adaptive specialists, but we also see things like, you know, the, the panel D versus E, that's a riparian plant versus a desert plant, sea level to alpine, these tiny sulfurs all the way up to big woody shrubs. Like the diversity in this group is extraordinary. Um, and I'm, I'm sure people are familiar with, with at least some of that. Um, 
And it's also, so this is a, a nice figure from, from uh, Dina Grossenbecker that, that uh, shows some of that diversity on the phylogenetic tree. And I'm going to kind of give you an idea of, of a map of some of the studies that we've done recently. We know that Mignol has these textbook examples of divergence from both an ecological and genetic point of view. And, and so the, the Mignol Silesia and Cardinalis pollinator isolation and, and ecogeographic isolation um, that Doug Shemsky, Justin Ramsey, Toby Bradshaw, and others have worked on um, on one end. And then things like cytoplasmic you know, sterility and the chance to compatibilities, chromosomal rearrangements um, that you find in, on the, in Gutatis and, and some of the relatives. Um, and one of the things I want to point out here that I think is a real opportunity for future work is that I, we have labs that study the ecology of speciation. We have labs that study the genetics of speciation. And I think one of the most important goals that we should have is to try to integrate across those. Um, an example would be this ecological study of isolation, years after some of the original papers were published, Leela Fishman came along and said, listen, there's, there's some important intrinsic incompatibilities going on in this system along with those ecological barriers. So, so Leela and her lab showed that there are chromosomal rearrangements and, and um, sort of uh, transmission distortion that were really important players in how much reproductive isolation there was between these, these two taxa. And even more recently, um, uh, Tom Nelson from her lab has shown that, that we integrate population genomics to, to understanding how divergence works in the system. Some of these, these study systems are going to be turned on their head. And so um, we now know that Lucia and Cardinalis don't appear to be each other's closest relative. And some of the phylogenetic patterns that, were, that, that appeared that way previously were due to aggression. And so I do want to make a, a case for integrating across multiple forms of isolation in some of the same pairs of taxa. Instead of us studying ecology in one pair of taxa and genetics in another, I think these are the kinds of studies we really need to push speciation forward is where we, we look at all of it at once. Um, so where are I, where do I think the current opportunities to, to advance our understanding of how isolation works in this group and, and obviously others? Um, I think there are a lot of forms of isolation that we're overlooking. I think that that um, if we're we're more careful about uh, examining forms of isolation, um, we can we can probably expand our knowledge of speciation quite a bit more um, than by by updating the way that we we calculate isolation. Um, I, especially when we can develop hypotheses about which ones which barriers we think will arise earliest. Um, like I said, I think we need to integrate across the ecological and genetic forms of isolation. And especially trying to, to bring in this idea of the speciation continuum and, and look at divergence at multiple points along that continuum. Um, I'd like to, to make a pitch for focusing in, on how both discontinuity and sympatric coexistence ultimately get achieved in, in these groups, which I think is a tall order, but something I think we need to, to work toward. Um, and then I think one of the reasons that we see some of the patterns in, in the reviews, um, the, the Christie paper that I mentioned, um, is that I don't, don't think that we're working hard enough to, to see hybrid fitness issues in later generation crosses. I want to I want to explore that just a little bit. Um, so a, a couple of examples from recent work in my lab. I just want to highlight some some work of, of students and collaborators. Um, we've been uh, sort of focusing on hybrid seeding viability quite a bit lately and across the genus Mimils. And I'm just going to um, uh, really briefly talk about some of the work of of a uh, recent master student, um, Horace Solomon, um, who's now in Jen Coughlin's lab at Yale. And she worked in these, the, this pair of taxa here, the, where the blue arrow is, um, Mimus Whitney and Mimus Constrictus. And it, it uh, um, these, these are each other's closest relative. They are, they are pretty hard to cross though. So we know that they, they are ecologically separated by altitude. One is a low elevation plant, one is high elevation. But then there are also, there's some difficulties in, in crossing. Um, in, and I want to just introduce the idea that that for non-plant people in angiosperms, the, this there's this really inter, interest, interesting interaction between the triploid endosperm and the diploid embryo um, that that uh, can provide an avenue to to develop hypotheses for barriers that might might be responsible for the earliest forms of of postzygotic isolation. Um, we know that maternal investment doesn't doesn't occur in the endosperm until after. Um, double fertilization occurs. And so there's conditions where evolutionary conflict might produce these really sort of, of um, uh, you know, important arms races. And there's great 
theoretical work by David Hig and others, along with some recent empirical studies on uh, in Minnows and Tomato, um, and especially uh, Claudia Kohler's work in, in Capsella, that suggests that hybrid endosperm is, is really easily disrupted. And it, and it sort of mimics the patterns we see in interploidy crosses. Um, so, so Hogerman crosses between Whitney and Constrictus and across many populations in, in each taxon. And in both cases, interspecific crosses are, are underdeveloped. And, and I'll say that when I see that this is a cryptic form of isolation, I, I, many of us who are, who are ecologists or, or at least have focused on ecology in the past have made crosses between taxa like this. And we see some seeds that, that are produced in the fruit. And we haven't been very careful about looking at, at the, the viability of those seeds beyond maybe trying some germination assays. And I think that there's there's clearly some, some very strong fitness issues that are happening here. Um, some of them can be subtle, but I think that they're, they're really important. Um, Hogar found that, that in, in uh, crosses between and within these, these species, there's always a decline in F1 embryo fitness and, and uh, oh, so in F1 fitness and, sorry, that, that popped up here. And then we can rescue those, those embryos by raising seeds that would otherwise not germinate on, on sucrose supplemented media so we have a, a pretty strong indication that that endosperm is why they're they're um, having issues. Um, I and just to to I'm I'm going to run out of time because I put too many slides in here. But um, I also want to highlight some things we're doing in in this section, Diplicus, and and this is this is work that that Matt Streisfeld started quite a while ago, and and before that, Vern Grant worked in this section in Mimulus, and this is a really amazing group of, of these woody shrubs with, that are nested within this, this group. Um, and, and thanks to Sean, we have this really wonderful uh, phylogeny and, and, and others, Malin Chase and, and, and Matt's work. Um, and so this, this group is a really recent radiation with, with all the necessary sort of, of ingredients to, to produce sort of advances in, in our understanding of isolation. Um, we focused on this this pair of taxa in the past, this yellow and red um, ecotype in, in Mimus pinicius, where we've estimated strength of pollinator isolation and also habitat isolation. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna skip past that to a certain extent. And, and also we know a lot about the, the genomic signatures of, of divergence. Um, I'm gonna skip past that to talk about a recent work of one of my students looking at the entire radiation of Diplicus to, to um, examine divergence at different points along the continuum. So not just the closest relatives, but now also uh, doing crosses between all of these members of, of this group. Um, this is this is Irene Martinez's work, um, who's a, a PhD student in the lab. And, and all these taxa that, that we're working with have different floral morphology and that look like shifts in pollination. Almost all of them have occur along these really steep environmental gradients. And what I'll point out is that this one taxon, the Musclevlandii, is the only one that's clearly sister to the rest of the group. It's the only one that's been defined as a different species in every taxonomy that's ever been done. Um, and so, and it's also the only one that that really ends up being sympatric with, with some of the other taxa in the group. Many of the others end up being, you know, very, very parapatric. They run into each other, they might form hybrid zones, but they don't overlap the way that, that Clevelandia does with the rest. Um, so Irene did, did uh, crosses within and between all of these different taxa. And we find that as we, we go from intraspecific on the far left, this is, this is a plot of seed size, again, looking at endosperm development, the further we go along the, the phylogenetic distance here, we get to the crosses involved in Clevelandii where we start to see really big problems in seed development. Um, they're most apparent when Clevelandii is, is the paternal parent, which is consistent with some of the expectations we have under, under a, a parental conflict. Um, and, and more recently, we've, we've looked at the way that F1 pollen fertility changes across this group. And so as we, again, looking at, at intraspecific F1s, um, we uh, see very high pollen fertility. But as you move across the group, you see these really sort of uh, gradual declines, but ending up being very substantial declines in pollen fertility as you get out to clip And again, I'll say that, that Ecology is sort of the, the rule here. The ecological barriers are present in, in almost all of these taxa. They would be roughly similar strengths of reproductive isolation. And now if we want to ask what, what makes what makes taxa able to, to withstand the, the uh, uh, sort of tests of sympatry, 
um, we get to these these sorts of barriers, the classic sort of post psychotic barriers that are present. Um, and finally, I just want to to end on one other um, uh, group in this in this radiation. Um, this is a pair of taxa, Numus calcinus and longiflorus, that are really at a similar stage of divergence to the red and yellow. They're really really close relatives. They they are parapatric. They they run into each other and, and form what looks like a hybrid zone. Um, and and we've tried to to we've been I think inspired by some of of Molly Schumer's recent work that that there may be way more sort of deleterious epistatic combinations in in pairs of taxa than previously appreciated. And so we've been focusing on these really early developmental stages in 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 hybrids to ask the question: Can we detect differences in in growth rate? Um, and we limit these these seedlings. Um, uh, in, in terms of nutrients so that they they have to sort of struggle to survive and, and can we detect differences among hybrid categories um, during this part of their life that we think is a major selective um, sort of uh, developmental time point. Um, this is work of my my uh, a newer grad student lab, Josh Connect, who's, who's looked at these the seedling growth rates from from early to just a you know this is 14 days after germination and what we see is this in in many cases f1s looking really similar to either parents so those f1s here and both parents that produce it on, on the outside and the f1s don't look like there's any post psychotic isolation but then when you look at the f2s you see not only we, they act like f2s they're they're highly variable and, and you know they have both the biggest and the smallest and growth rates but on average they're also substantially smaller than the parents or the f1s and so I think this is a, a good indication that we do have mildly deleterious epistatic combinations and that overall the F2 is, is showing us something that we're missing when we look at just F1 fitness in, in isolation. So um, just quick summary, we think that these organismal and genetics perspectives for measuring isolation are, are really, I think they're fantastic because I think they, they're complementary um, and hopefully they, they we can use both to try to understand how divergence is working in both allopatric um, pairs of taxa and non allopatric um, the, the RI metrics that make these intuitive connections to hybridization and gene flow, I think, have allowed us to really identify some of the, the emerging rules governing speciation in this group. Um, but I also think there's lots of opportunities to, to further understanding by being more careful in sort of ecologists looking at genetics and geneticists looking at ecology, so that we've, we're looking at, at the same set of barriers within, within these cases of divergence, um, so we can make more progress towards understanding how, how speciation works. Um, and with that, I'll just thank my, my lab collaborators and, and funding sources and, and 